Well, hello everyone, it's Philip Shields, and with a topic I hope you'll all find interesting and thought-provoking, that's what I try to find, as God leads me to give these. If you could be more righteous than you are currently, wouldn't you love to be? Of course, we know our true righteousness is from God. I, I hope you know I've been teaching that, gifted to us, as we can read so clearly from the last half of Romans 4, even Romans 3. But Romans 4 through the end of Romans 5, especially between verses 15 and 19, the gift of righteousness and all of that, and Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, I don't want the righteousness from the law, Paul said, but that which is from God through faith. And so please understand that I get that. But in the end, we would like to see that our lives are changing, overcoming, growing, and actually truly becoming more and more like God, don't we? We'd like to see tangible evidence we are becoming more righteous every day, every month in our lives. I hope, I hope you agree with me on that. So, but crazy as it sounds, crazy as it sounds, do you realize we can become too righteous? Look at Ecclesiastes 7.16. Remember, you can follow along in the notes, too, where I have all these scriptures written out. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes seven sixteen, Do not, do not be overly righteous. How can you be overly righteous? Well, that's kind of what we're talking about here today. Overly righteous. Nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? When we become too righteous... <clears throat> We can destroy ourselves. I'm Philip Shields, host of LightOnTheRock.org. And I hope you're getting a lot out of our sermons and blogs. And if so, please spread the word. Tell others. And you can also leave comments on our blogs, comments, uh, and, and, and likes, and so on, on our sermons and blogs. Our audio, where it says audio, means, means just like this one, one you listen to. Uh, you don't get to see, but you listen to. And then the ones that say video are videos. And then there are blogs, which are short articles. Those also, your comments also encourage me, as well as encourages others to check out the site. So in our quest to obey God, we start doing things sometimes that go way beyond what God said. That's what I mean about being more righteous than God. Those becoming overly righteous are usually being super strict on how they obey, what they expect of others too. In a way, being more righteous than God or overly righteous, uh, if God requires one thing, they tend to go further. That's how I'm defining this more righteous than God. Now, any of us could be doing it without even realizing it. So I want to try to help point out some of the ways or you could give this kind of topic over and over and over and over with different examples all the way through. Uh, the standard of perfect righteousness, of course, is God himself. He is perfect, flawless, good, holy, never lies. It's never wrong. He's righteousness personified. He is love personified. He is love. So how on earth can any mortal ever act or think he's more righteous than God? I don't think we want to think we're more righteous than God. I'm just saying that we end up being that way. Um, I mean, even Job said, you know, when I speak, God, God should take note of what I'm saying. <laughs> Of course, no mortal could ever, in fact, be more righteous than God, but we act like it too many times. We teach, we require a belief, a practice, a conduct among our brethren that um, goes beyond what God requires. And uh, be honest, we all do it. I've done it. You've done it. And I'll give a sermon soon on judging others. Believe it or not, there are times to judge. I know Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. I know that. But there are other verses that say we're supposed to learn how to judge. So I'm going to try to give the balance on that topic as well. That's part of this becoming more righteous than God. We judge others. They're not doing things the right way. Uh, we, we're actually supposed to have the very righteousness of God, uh, which he gifts us, as Romans 5, 17 to 19 tell us, and so many other places. Uh, I do have a sermon, a three-part sermon, that I titled Righteousness-Dash 
Righteousness, yours or God's, part one. I'll put in the notes here today. There's part two and three as well. It's very important that we understand we are to be righteous, the righteousness of God gifted to us, given to us, and then let God live in us. That means we'll live obediently. It doesn't mean that you don't have to keep the law. We will still keep the law by Christ doing it inside of us. But it's his righteousness. There are still multiple thousands in the church who teach and believe that somehow we are to grow in righteousness to the point, grow in it ourselves until I think they think they're good enough or have finally can be confident that they've qualified for God's kingdom. Do you use that term qualify for the kingdom? For God to accept you, you have to qualify for the kingdom. You have to qualify. I think they're missing something. The one who qualified is Jesus. You can read that so clearly in Romans 8, especially verses 3 and 4, that the righteous requirement of the law was fulfilled in Christ for us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So, but he is the one who qualifies. And there's a verse in Colossians that say that God the Father has accepted us into the kingdom of his dear Son. I think that's Colossians 1.12 or something like that. <clears throat> the one who qualified sinlessly was Christ. Please learn uh, what Scripture actually teaches us. It's actually very encouraging, enriching, and brings tremendous peace and joy when you understand that your righteousness is not going to be what God is judging as to whether you'll be in the kingdom or not. What he's judging is, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? and as your righteousness, and if you have, you will be saved. You have been saved if you have. But then from then on, like, you know, you, you all know Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, that for we have been saved, past tense, through faith, through, through grace, by, by grace through faith. And then you go on reading verse 10, that we are his workmanship, created for good works. So it doesn't mean we're, we, we do nothing, no. But our righteousness and our confidence in being in God's kingdom is because of what Yeshua, Jesus, did. Okay? The focus of this blog is this. In our quest to please God, don't do what many Orthodox, those are the strict Jews, the Orthodox Jews do. They add to whatever God says in the law, and they make God's way stricter and tougher than he said it had to be. And these they call their tradition. And their traditions become more powerful, more important, they will openly admit this, than even God's word. If it's the tradition, that's what they follow. The Talmud and all of that. But it's not just the Jews doing it. Many Christians do it as well. You and I have probably done it as well. Probably any one of us who seek to obey God have done this, including me. I'll, go, I'll give many examples today, and I hope that gets you thinking about other ways that you end up trying to be more righteous than God. For example, Orthodox Jews taught that if God's law could be compared to a garden, a garden you must not step on, must not break anything in there, must not step on the vegetables or the flowers. And so they decided, well, if we're not supposed to step on the law, the, the, like a garden, let's put a fence around that garden a few feet away from it so that we don't, and we're not able to break the law itself. And then the fence became their tradition. The fence became their tradition of more importance than the garden. And that's what, that's what I'm talking about. It sounds good enough at first glance, but it puts rules where God did not intend there to be rules. Don't get stricter than God. Don't allow or disallow, contrary to the Bible. But live instead by every word of God. No, don't add to it. Deuteronomy 8.3, that man shall live by every word of God. Matthew 4.4 4 says that. Luke 4.4 4 says that. Here are some common examples of what I mean of becoming more righteous than God. Let's start with your church services. What we allow and disallow to happen? What do we allow and disallow in our church services? I hope you pastors are listening. Are you following the Bible? 
living by every word of God? Or are you following your church's traditions? Are you being more righteous than God in this area? Some church groups forbid any musical instruments during the church service. I don't know what they do with all the many, many psalms that speak of the lyre, the timbrel, the harp, cymbals, trumpets, stringed instruments. I don't know what they do with all those scriptures living by every word of God. But maybe your church allows music. You guys can sing. You guys, um, uh, the other one just does it by a cappella, uh, no, no, no accompaniment. Maybe your church allows at least a piano. Or maybe they display the music and the words up on some screen with some music behind it. But would these same churches and pastors allow a guitar or several guitars, tambourines, timbrels, in other words, trumpets, cymbals, cymbals, cymbals? Is that biblical? Well, you'll see. What does God say? What he says should be our standard, not some man-made tradition that makes us no better than the Pharisees who did it all the time. Now let's read what the Bible does say. In Psalm 150, verses 3 to 5. Praise him, talking about praising God, with the sound of the trumpet. So those of you who are part of a church that allow no musical instruments, what do you do with Psalm 150 and so many others? Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel, that's like a tambourine, and dance, and dance. Wow. Praise him with stringed instruments, like a harp, like a guitar, like a cello, and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Can you imagine that in your church? Praise ye the Lord, oh, you know, that, you know, and then praise ye the Lord's clash cymbals. Praise ye the Lord, clash cymbals. I don't think if I brought cymbals in that I'd be allowed to get past the first couple cymbals clashing before I'd be quickly being escorted out in many churches. That's not the way David saw it. That's not the way David saw it. That's not the way the Bible sees it. Can you imagine that in your church service? If not, why not? Do you want to live by every word of God or by traditions of your church? Pastors, why don't you challenge this uh, with, your, with your hierarchy and see if they would do that? Okay, now how long would you and I last in church if I praise God with loud clashing cymbals? Are you going to follow God's tradition or the Bible? Would you let anyone worship like Psalm 150 says? Would you? Or will you be more righteous than God instead and say, no, 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 we can't allow that in church. We'll follow what our church has always done, one piano and everybody standing up and boringly sing three songs and... Uh, or would you allow timbrels, cymbals, string, stringed instruments? Okay, Psalm 150, verse 4. Praise him with the dance? With the dance, really? Psalm 149. I don't see dancing going on in the churches that I usually attend. Uh, if not outright dancing, maybe a little movement of the body in tune with, I mean, in harmony and in, in sync with the music. That's what I'm looking for, sync, in synch uh, synchrony, synchronized with the um, music. Psalm 149, verses 2 and 3. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Hey, be happy. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name. Psalm 149, verse 3. Let them praise his name with the dance. It's in the Bible. Shall live by every word of God. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and the harp. With the dance? Be turning over to Second Samuel 6, verses 12 to 16, if you would, please. Second Samuel 6, verses 12 to 16. And um, there's a time when the ark was taken by the 
uh, was taken by the Philistines, and it was not in the in the uh, tabernacle at all. At some point, uh, it was kept by somebody, you know, um, in his house, and he was so tremendously blessed that they thought, well, maybe we can bring it back now safely into the ark because they had been cursed when they weren't moving it correctly before. And so when it started to come up, we can read in Second Samuel 6, and you'll find out that dancing as we worship God and sing to God is very delightful to God, otherwise he wouldn't be telling us to do it. But how many American, British, European churches do that, especially Northwestern European, and our staid uh, Danish, Norwegian, English backgrounds? Second Samuel 6, verses 12 to 16. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And Second Samuel 6, verse 13. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Now look at verse 14 and beyond. Second Samuel 6, verse 14. Then David danced before Yehovah, before YHVH, okay, is what it says here, with all his might. He danced with all his might. He wasn't just moving kind of in a blah way back and forth in sync with the music, like I said earlier. He danced with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. Just like the priest wore. Now, I'm not saying he was a priest here, but he wore the same thing the priests were wearing. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of Jehovah with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And then verse 16, Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, David's wife, looked through a window and saw King David. King David leaping and whirling before Jehovah, and she despised him in her heart. He's the king. Why is he dancing like some commoner down there? She despised him, and he never slept with her again after that. Whether that was too severe or not, I don't know. But uh, David was leaping and dancing, and... Uh, I think one of the translations even says weeping and twirling. Um, I'm trying to find it now where, where it says that. But anyway, my point is he's not just dancing. He's, he's dancing with a lot of vigor. He's dancing and whirling, like the New King James says, whirling before Jehovah. Brethren, where did we get the idea that church services and song services should be so boring? Are you getting my point? Are we living by every word of God, or are we not? That we sing to him with the psaltery and the, and the trumpet and the clashing cymbals and with the dance. You wouldn't dare do that in your church, and you know it. But are you becoming more righteous than God? The sons of Korah. Remember, Korah was a bad rebel back in number 16. And uh, Moses had said, all of you, uh, if you don't get away from Korah, you're going to die with him. So apparently enough of his children left. And they went on to become what we call the sons of Korah in the Bible. And who uh, wrote a lot of the Psalms. They were great singers. And notice what they wrote in Psalm 47, verse 1. These are from the sons of Korah. Grand, great, 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 great grandsons of Korah. Psalm 47, verse 1. Here's something else. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. How many times have you ever, ever in your church services shouted out, Hallelujah! Praise God! Have you ever clapped your hands as you sang and danced? <laughs> Too many churches I've attended are boring, unexciting. We're praising God, remember. And many groups forbid clapping hands ever as you sing or ever in church services. 
Can you shout out your hallelujah or are you scared to? Let me be clear. If you cannot do some of these because it's just not your nature to, to sing vigorously or to whirl and dance or to clap your hands or use instruments like cymbals and timbrels or tambor uh, tambourines, then that's fine. Uh, that's you. God understands that. I'm not asking if you're not able to do that because it's just not you to do that. It's fine. But if you're not doing it because your church won't do it, that's different. So let those who want to clap their hands, who want to shout out the hallelujahs, who want to dance, let them do so. Let them obey the word of God. Just don't criticize those, in other words, who are doing this. Look, Miriam also danced in the, with the tambourine or timbrel after God's powerful miracle of drying up the Red Sea for a pathway for two or three million Israelites to go through the Red Sea to the other side to Midian. And then they, it was a big wall of um, on, on each side of them, we were told, a wall of water, probably many, many stories high. The Bible even says the wall congealed, congealed. And then when all the Israelites were through, God made all those walls crash down onto the Egyptians. And this was a time to celebrate. But let me be clear, as I read about Miriam in Exodus 15, if you want to go there in your own Bible, let me be clear, you don't have to dance and tambourines and all that. Some of you may, but maybe due to your staid white European nature, you just can't. But neither should you or any pastor look down on, prohibit, or condemn those who want to follow Scripture and do clap their hands, do dance, do use instruments as they worship, as they sing, as they praise God. Pastors, wake up to this. Liven up your church services in praise to the mighty God of us all. Praising our awesome Abba, God Most High, and our Lord Jesus Christ should not be boring like it is in so many congregations that I've attended. Most congregations. Now, Exodus 15, verses 20 to 21. And then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel, like a tambourine, in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And I have attended some churches where they have people in front or around the side dancing. They might even have banners with them. That's fine. And Miriam answered them. Some of them are young and teenagers and young men and women, by the way. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider, he is thrown into the sea. Right now, some of you are unfamiliar with all of this that I'm saying. You might be thinking, Ah, Philip, you're going nuts. You're going overboard. Have I said anything to you so far that it's against one word of Scripture? That should be your standard. Live by every word of God. I have a lot more to share, so I hope you'll keep listening and learning what Scripture actually says compared to what we actually do or forbid or require. Next thing, why do some churches and pastors forbid lifting holy hands during prayer, during praise when, or when singing? Oh, no, no, you can't lift hands in our church. That's what the Pentecostals do. So we can't do that here. Tell Moses that when Aaron and Hur lifted his hands high during the battle with Amalek in Exodus 17, verses 8 to 13, and whenever he got too tired to keep his hands up, they were losing. Whenever he would raise his hands, they would win. God obviously liked it. So Aaron and Hur uh, got a stone, had him sit down on the stone, and then they held up his hands so Israel would win. Or try to tell Paul that. We're not supposed to raise our hands in prayer. Look what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. I actually have a whole sermon on it. I, de I desire, therefore, that men everywhere, that men everywhere lifting up their hands, lifting up, Holy hands without wrath. 
I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath. So why not follow Paul's instructions, start doing it? Or try to tell King David that in many of his psalms he was just plain wrong to teach us to raise our hands and arms in praise. Why be more righteous though than the Bible? If you just can't do it yourself, it's just not you, start at home when you pray beside your bed or something. Just lift up your hands to your neck level, your chest level. Start with that in the privacy of your own room as you pray, as you sing. And then try it higher and higher as you go along in the privacy of your own room. Pretty soon you'll start to feel something like a child, like a four-year-old running up to mommy or daddy who's come home from a trip. Mommy, mommy. Daddy, daddy. They lift up their hands in joy. That's how I teach, teach it and see it. And God in turn looks down with joy upon me picks me up, picks me up above him even, you know, and rejoices in that. Are you yourself, if you've never done it, why not? And if you can't, don't forbid it from others doing it. Let others do it. Paul says that, 1 Timothy 2.8. Psalm 41, verse 2, Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. If you see me in church services during the song service, I will lift up my hands when I feel inspired by the song. I don't do it all the way through, but when I feel inspired, or I'll lift up my hands in hallelujahs and amens, perhaps even during a sermon being preached, or something I'm hearing, or a prayer being said. Would your church allow you to obey that? Would you be willing to at least start trying it and not afraid that somehow you're doing something wrong? Nehemiah 8, let's read another. Nehemiah 8, verse 6. The Jews had just returned from captivity from Babylon. And it, what we're about to read, verse 2 says, pertains to all the people, including the women, including children who were present together. By the way, those of you guys in Africa, quit having the men sit on one side and the women on the other. Ukrainians do that too. Where's that coming from? Family should be together. So I'm putting a stop to that in Kenya and Tanzania. We need to have the fathers sitting with their children, with their families. Not men on one side, women on the other. How ridiculous. Numbers 8, verse 6, Ezra blessed Jehovah, the great God. And then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. The word is Amen. Some of you want to go into Judaism and say Amen, because you're afraid that by saying Amen, you're taking some Egyptian God's name, um, you know, or, or one of the uh, pharaohs, Amenhotep, or some of the others. Amen, amen, that's the Hebrew. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They bowed their heads, but they, while lifting up their hands, are you getting it? It's not just David. It's all through the Bible. And... If you've never done this, you're really missing out on a part of praise. It's very, very biblical. Are you going to insist that what your group insists is somehow right and the Bible is somehow wrong and you guys are more righteous somehow than the Bible, than God, in both the Old and the New Testaments? Psalm 63, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 63, verses 3 and 4. Because of your loving kindness is because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Then I will bless you while I live. Psalm 63, 4. I will lift up my hands in your name. 
when are all of us going to start doing this? I'm challenging you to obey every word of God. You claim you do. Do it. When we worship with King David in the new kingdom to come, we will see him raising his hands in worship and prayer. We will see the sons of Korah, the Levites, the priests, raising their hands in praise and worship. Will you and I follow that example, or will we be already doing it so often that it's a natural thing? Please be honest. Realize you're following man-made traditions of being boring in your church services. God likes life in our worship. Solomon must have often seen his dad raise his hands in praise, so when Solomon dedicated the temple that he had just built, God's temple, 1 Kings 8.22, at the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings 8.22, Solomon stood before the altar of Jehovah in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. Obviously, they're being lifted up. If you want more scriptures, more examples, more on this, I have a sermon, about a 35-minute sermon on this very point, and I'll put it in my notes right here. So the first thing I said, your church service is, hey, it's okay to sing, it's okay to dance, it's okay to clap hands, it's okay to have instruments, even cymbals, trumpets, guitars. It's okay. And it's okay to raise holy hands in prayer and it's okay to dance even as you worship yes it is if you see any of the videos from Bukumburi in Kenya and maybe some of the other ones you'll see I, I have one there of a lady giving special music and as she sings she's not dancing in a powerful way but she is moving her body back and forth as she dances and I thought it was beautiful beautifully done beautiful song beautiful and sometimes people will say what why is she dancing well the Bible says to and that's why this next point is more for those of you into Hebrew roots or Messianic congregations or who have come out of those don't get into Judaism by Judaism I mean the traditions that they added to the law I mean the things that Jesus corrected and reprimanded them for. Jesus rejected Judaism. Don't think of Judaism as the right religion in the Bible. It isn't. It is not. It's nothing like the correct religion. For example, so often we look to the Jews and how to keep the Sabbath. As Jesus corrected them on their Sabbath. So we don't necessarily try to have challah bread. We don't try to have the same rituals that begin the Sabbath because they do. Lighting of the candles and saying certain prayers and so on. Um, and their prayers about God who created the vine and, and all that, you know, all the fruits and vegetables that come from the earth. I don't know if the prayer is wrong, but I'm just saying that's Judaism. That's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. So don't follow Judaism or feel that someone is less righteous because they don't do all that as the Sabbath comes to them. Another example, insisting on using just Jewish or Hebrew words or even names. I've known some groups where the people within the church changed their name to a Jewish one. Instead of saying Jim or James, they go by Yaakov or Jacob. I don't know if it's wrong, but hey, if mom named you Jake, uh, James, why change it to Jacob? Or someone whose name is Nathan, it's suddenly Nathan. Or John becomes Johanna or Johan or Johanna. Where is that in the Bible to do that? In fact, what we find in the Bible, listen carefully, Paul had a Hebrew name, it was Shaul, where we get Saul in English. Acts 9, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul, or Shaul, changed his Hebrew name to the one you all know him by, a Roman name, Paul. He went from Hebrew to Roman. The man we know as Daniel, that's his Hebrew name. He was given a Babylonian name, as were his three friends. We know his three friends better by their Babylonian names than we do their Hebrew names. Their names were changed from Hebrew to Babylonian. Shedrach, Meshach, Abednego. There was a preacher named Apollos in the book of Acts. His name came from the name of a pagan god, Apollo. His name was Apollos. In Greek, they add the S to the end of the word. But there's no record of him changing his name back to a Hebrew name. So don't be more righteous than God. If your name is George, it's still George. If your name is John, it's John. Paul, Apollos, Daniel's friends are, are examples where their names were actually changed from Hebrew to a Gentile name. So though I sometimes, you'll hear me say the Hebrew words, like Elohim, or Yehovah, or Shalom, or Shabbat, or Abba, or Yahweh. You don't have to. I've had the hardest time convincing the brethren in Kenya, you don't have to say Abba, you don't have to say Yahweh. You don't have to say Elohim. We're not a part of the sacred names movement. Now, holy, hallowed be thy name. Yeah, God's name is holy. But the sacred names group says you're going to hell, basically, if you, if you say words like Jesus or God. Please don't teach that. Please don't teach what we don't have to do, which is having to use having to use those names you'll hear me say Yeshua you'll hear me say Elohim but you don't have to for example Elohim is not even the name of God Elohim means God or gods actually Elohim is what he is he is God did you realize all of you who think Elohim is something more holy if you say Elohim that Elohim was also the word they used for the false gods? Yehovah himself, the Lord himself, says in Exodus 12, 12, I'm going to send out this plague, and I'm going to strike all the firstborn of man and beast all through the land of Egypt. And upon all the Elohim, the gods of Egypt. I'll give a sermon next spring, maybe go into more detail, I think I have in the past, of how every god, everything alive practically, or even, like even the Nile was a god. A dung beetle was a god, I kid you not, the one animal they did not turn into a god was the sheep, the lamb. Exodus 12, 12, I will destroy, the true God says, I will destroy the Elohim, the gods of Egypt. So Elohim is not some special word. When Paul preached to the Greeks in Athens and other places, he didn't change the word to Yahweh or Yehovah. He used the Greek word Theos, T-H-E-O-S, meaning God in Greek. Please understand this, all of you. Please understand this. But some of you are teaching that when we say the English words God or Jesus, we will burn in the lake of fire. Or we're doing something that's not good. Stop! That certainly is not the teaching of light on the rock. Okay, Paul used the word theos. In fact, you don't find anywhere in the New Testament that they're using Yehovah. I do myself often change the English words the Lord into the Hebrew Yehovah or YHVH because God says don't add any words to his word. They add the word the Lord. 
There's no za there. The word za they're putting before what they call his name, the Lord. Lord is not his name. Lord is not what YHVH even means. So almost 7,000 times, 6,800 or something like that, we're adding the word za, and then we change the name YHVH to Lord. On the contract called the covenant, you don't change names on covenants. And when you add the word za, it changes his name Yehovah into a title like the Lord, or some say the eternal, the eternal. It's not what scripture says. Okay, there's no the there, and the word is not Lord. Eternal is a little closer. Yehovah is his name, or Y-H-V-H anyway, not Lord. Now, Adonai means Lord, my Lord. But Adonai is a different word. And another thing the Jews have done is they've changed all the places where it's Y-H-V-H and substituted it for Adonai, or sometimes Hashem, which means the name. They change the Bible because they misunderstood that God somehow didn't want us using his name when in fact so many of the very names of the babies as they were born were being given a part of the very name of the Creator. Ishayahu, Isaiah, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah. You hear the Yah on the end here? Uriah. Okay. And these are, they, they would name their babies by the name of God, or the shortened name, Yah. And every time, if any of you think I'm going overboard on this, and you would never do that, every single time you say the name or the word, hallelujah, you're using a Hebrew word, you're using the name of God at the end of it. Yah, hallelujah. Do you realize that? So I don't want to mistranslate and change the name of our Creator. So sometimes I'll say YHVH, sometimes I'll say Yehovah. To me, the most recent evidence shows that when they go back to the oldest codexes that have the whole word written out with the vowel points in it, they've found over 1,500 so far where every single time the vowel points put the pronunciation as Yehovah, not Yahweh every single time. So that's why I say Yehovah. And again, he was not, in fact, he says, in, in when he talks about the new covenant, he says that the day is coming that they'll no longer say, do you know the Lord? Because everybody will know Yehovah from the least of them to the greatest as the waters cover the sea. Everyone will know my name. And my name shall be praised among the Gentiles. Not just in Israel. So I do myself sometimes change the Lord from our English Bibles into the Hebrew Yehovah because of YHVH, because we're told not to add the words the, or to change it to Lord, which by the way is the, if you take the word Baal, where we often say Baal, you know what that means? It means Lord. When Bathsheba asked David for time off to go mourn the death of her husband Uriah, she asked him, if you look at the Hebrew, I need to go mourn my Baal, my Lord, because husbands were your Lord. So anyway, I'm just saying, when we say Lord, we're actually saying <laughs> one of the words that we get from Baal or Baal or Adonai, Adon also means Lord. I'm not saying it's bad to say Lord. Don't misunderstand me. But Y-H-V-H, Yehovah, does not mean Lord. Adonai does mean Lord, but not Yehovah. So I don't want to mistranslate and change the name of our Creator. I hope you're following what I'm saying. Quit acting more righteous than Paul or the Bible on this matter of his name or on God. 
those of you in Kenya and Africa, listen. You can use your own words in Swahili, in Luo, Kisi, um, Swahili, or whatever your languages are. You have 70, 80 languages over there. All within even the country of Kenya, they have, I think, 75 languages. In Swahili, the word for God, I believe, is Mungu. Use it! Who gave us our languages? God did. Or instead of saying Lord in Swahili, you can say Buana. Master, Lord, Buana. That's okay to say Buana instead of Lord. It's okay to say Mungu instead of God. Don't be more righteous than God. Paul used the language of the people he was talking to. If Apostle Paul came to Kenya and he was speaking and using the Swahili words or speaking to you in Swahili, he would say Mungu. He would say Buana. Don't be more righteous than Paul or the Bible. Nor do we have to force brethren who can't read Hebrew and neither can any of you pastors that I'm speaking to in Kenya, to have to use Hebrew words. So someone picks up the phone with me and they say, Shalom. Great. I'm happy with Shalom. That's okay. But don't act like you're going to speak Hebrew now. You might know five words. Shalom, Abba, Yahweh, what else? Shabbat, if you can spell it. Uh, after that, I slowed down. That's four Hebrew words that some of you, many of you may know, but you can't even do the whole Hebrew alphabet. So why make a big deal of it? Do you know what the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet are? Aleph and Tav. Do you know what they stand for? Do you know what the second letter is? Aleph, Bet, and then Gimel, isn't it? Or Dalet or whatever it is. I, you know, I, right now I don't even know myself, but I know some of it. But I don't claim to have to speak Hebrew or my people have to speak Hebrew. So I'll see which of you in Africa start to follow the truth on this. And feel free to use your God-given languages and start saying Mungu or Buana or whatever your language word is. You don't know Hebrew, so why pretend that you do? Now, if you still want to say Elohim and Shalom, okay. But it's not your language. You don't know enough Hebrew to speak more than four, five, six words. I, I don't get it, Kenyans. Tanzanians, I don't get it. Another way we try to be more holy than God, without even realizing it, is the way we keep the Sabbath day. The Bible says to rest on the Sabbath. Almost every scripture about the Sabbath is about stopping work, not working, resting. Shabbat, Sabbath means stop, means cease, it means rest. There's one verse in all, all the Old Testament that says have a holy convocation on the Sabbath that I know of. There may be others, but that's the only one I know of. Leviticus 23, verse 3. Okay, six days shall work be done, Leviticus 23, 3, but the seventh day is a Shabbat, is a Sabbath of solemn rest. A holy convocation. But, what, look, but look at what even comes ahead of holy convocation. It's rest. You shall do no work on it. It's the Sabbath of Jehovah and all your dwellings. Of course, the fourth commandment, which I'll post in the notes here, doesn't even mention going to church services. It focuses entirely instead on resting. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. How? Remember that in six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath, the stop of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, don't even let your cattle work. Don't let strangers who are visiting with you work. That's what it says. Okay? Let's not be more holy than God. Four and six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them. Exodus 20, verse 11 and rested on the seventh day. It doesn't even say he had church services with Adam and Eve. He might have. But if he did, we don't know it. I'm not saying we shouldn't go to church. 
course, church is the people. You are the church. You don't just go to church. I'm just saying don't spend so much time at church that you have no time left to take a nap or rest or spend the time with your children or do personal prayer and Bible study. When I first started working with some Kenyans, I found that some of them literally went to church at 8.30 in the morning and stayed there until sundown because they thought that somehow that's how you're supposed to keep Sabbath services. Some of them slept in their church clothes because they thought it was wrong to change clothes on the Sabbath or to brush their teeth or take a shower or to wash up. And I had to change all that. Where are we getting the idea spend all day long in Sabbath services? You know, getting or, you know, getting by the time you take all the time to get ready for church, then walk or drive to church, being in church, remaining in church after services, fellowshipping. Then you might have an afternoon service or potluck or something. And then more fellowship. And then the drive or walk back home. By the time Sabbath is over, no rest was done. And in fact, you feel completely worn out. You did not obey the command to rest. And you don't feel rested. So don't be more righteous than God. And insist on being in church all day long when God doesn't say you have to. Something's terribly wrong with that picture. On Sabbath, rest. It should be a day we all look forward to. It should be a day by the end of Sabbath we feel so rested. Some go the other extreme and they feel they can't do anything on Sabbath. They can't change clothes. They can't brush their teeth. That's ridiculous. That's from Orthodox Judaism. They find it wrong to open the fridge door because a light turns on and that's starting a fire. They can't turn on the lights in the room or turn them off. They can't warm up the living room in wintertime. And so on and on. The Sabbath should be a day we look forward to. We do not follow Jewish traditions. Please understand. Next point. Judaism clearly was not the religion of Moses nor of Christ. So I distance myself from anything that is clearly from Judaism, Judaism's traditions. Instead of coming from Scripture. In Mark 6, verses 6 to 13, I'll just have you guys read that yourselves. I'll start it, though. Mark 7, verses 6 to 13. Yeshua, Jesus, answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah the prophesy. I like to say Yeshua, by the way, sometimes, because in Hebrew it means salvation. In English, we just know it as a name most of the time. In Hebrew, the very word is, is salvation. That's what it is. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the traditions, the commandments of men. He mentions tradition in verse 8. Verse 9, All too well you reject God's commandment. So you can keep your tradition. And then he gives example of that. Therefore, in verse 13, you make the word of God no effect, has no power through your tradition, which you've handed down. He's condemning tradition. So just let me say this. I, for one, do not follow Jewish traditions on how to keep Sabbath or Passover or the Seder with that abominable pagan egg from Babylon or the sequence that they do and they focus entirely on the Old Testament when Jesus said do this in remembrance of me when you keep the night to be observed I hope that you will focus on the real meaning of all of this is Jesus not just coming out of Egypt it's okay to read about coming out of Egypt to sing about it to have plays about it. That's fine. But someone needs to always say, of course, all of this points to 
Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So don't be looking into Judaism, which rejects Jesus. Judaism, which rejects the brand new, brand new covenant, not just renewed covenant, for your answers on how to worship God. Remember the Jews are giving more weight to their own traditions than to the very word of God. So when I'm in church, even if I'm in a Messianic or Hebrew Roots church, I do not pray by reading from the Jewish prayer book. Most of those are from people who would not have honored Jesus, who would not have acknowledged him as the Messiah. I'll pray from my heart. I don't wear a kippah, head covering, or, or wear a prayer shawl or a talit, all of which comes out of Judaism. God's word plainly says in 1 Corinthians 11, 7, 1 Corinthians 11, 7, that a man should not cover his head. So that's what I follow. When I brought that up one time when somebody was teaching, you know, like during a, after church, it was early evening, they had a campfire going, and he was saying, of course, you all should be wearing kippah. And I raised my hand and I said, Paul said, don't cover your head. And all he could say, oh, Paul, Paul, he, he, was not, he was not a very good Jew. That's what he said. But I follow what the Bible says. A man should not cover his head. In light on the rock, I don't want any men covering their heads. I believe the evidence is that Jews did not wear a kippah, in fact, a head covering. In the days of Christ, it came later to differentiate them from the Christians, the Jewish Christians. I also believe that God's laws are now written in my heart. So I don't need strings or tassels with 613 knots in them to symbolize the 613 points of the law. I will guarantee you, I'd, I'll guarantee you that somebody wearing tassels could not recite to me as they looked at their tassels. You know, their blue and white tassels. All 613. They couldn't recite 200, maybe not even 100 of the 613 laws that the tassels supposed to help them remember. If you feel you have to wear tzitzit in the New Testament, fine, but it was not listed as one of the things that the non-Jews had to do according to the rulings of Acts 15. So I don't. And you don't have to. What's more important is that the law is written on your heart and you seek to obey God because you love Him, not because you're wearing these funny-looking tassels that sometimes I even know people who wear tassels, but they tuck them in so no one can see them. If you're going to wear tassels, don't be ashamed of them. But I don't wear them. Nor do I have to use Jewish words. I've talked about that already. I don't have to say Abba. I say Father. I'll say Abba sometimes. I say hello. Sometimes I'll say Shalom. I don't have to, though, and you don't have to. I love saying Our God instead of just saying God. Instead of feeling I have to say Elohim or Yahweh or Yehovah or Yeshua or Yehoshua. I'm not, a, certainly Yahshua, Y-A-H-Shua, that's not even biblical, that's not even historical. Some, some groups go with Y-A-H-Shua and study that. It's, it's a man-made word from the 1950s as I've researched it. But I'm not afraid to say Yeshua or Yehovah, Yahweh. I don't have to say Hashem, the name. Another point, I do not, our women in Light on the Rock do not feel they have to cover their head with cloth. A woman's long hair is her covering, the Bible says. Let's not be more righteous from God. We're not Muslims, we're not Jews. Unless you have short hair, then you should cover it. If a woman has real short hair. But 1 Corinthians 11.15 says if a woman has long hair, Listen carefully, 1 Corinthians 11, 15. 
If a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. We're not Jews, we're not Muslims. Don't let Jewish traditions come into your worship. Let me wrap up with a few other things here. We become more righteous from, than God if you follow the Jewish tradition of fasting on the Day of Atonement for 25 hours. Oh, they have to make it better than God's Word. They have to be more righteous than God. Leviticus 23, verse 32 says, Day of Atonement shall be a Sabbath rest. You shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. That's 24 hours, not 25, not 26. Don't be more righteous than God. It shall be to you a Sabbath rest. The word solemn in your King James and New King James Bibles is not there. The Sabbath is not, the atonement is not a dire, sad day. It is not. In fact, right here in Leviticus 23, 32, it ends the passage by saying, you shall celebrate. It's not a solemn day. You shall celebrate your Sabbath. Celebrate that that ram has been killed and his blood is covering your sins. Celebrate Azazel has been, had all the sins of the nation put upon it and has been thrown out, taken away. Celebrate that. Whenever you see in your King James or New King James Bibles a word in italics, it's indicating that's not in the original language. Solemn is not there. The Bible says Holy Day offerings should be three times a year. But what do we do? We take a Holy Day offering on all seven because we're more righteous than God. That's not what the Bible says. We appear before Him without... Uh, we're not to appear before him empty-handed three times a year. Deuteronomy 16, 16, and 17 says that. Deuteronomy 16, 16, and 17. I'll put them in the notes. Three times a year. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16 and 17. Three times a year should all your males appear before the Lord your God. Now the women could go too, but the men is for sure had to be there. But we find that Mary and Joseph both went to Passover, for example. We find in Nehemiah chapter 8 that the men, women, and children were there on the, on the Feast of Trumpets. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God, before Jehovah your God, in the place which he chooses. And it mentions them, the Days of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay, I meant, at the Feast of Weeks, that means Pentecost, the Feast of First Fruits, okay? It's known by different names. And at the Feast of Tabernacles. They shall not appear before Jehovah empty handed. Every man shall give as he's able, according to the blessing of Jehovah your God, which he has given you. And that's repeated again in Exodus 23. So, three times a year. So, that's what we do in Light on the Rock. We will take Holy Day offerings on Pentecost, and then again at the Feast of Tabernacles, and again at the Days of Unleavened Bread on the first day. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Just, let, let's read now in James 1, verses 22 to 25. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. James 1, 25, I mean 22 to 25. You've heard this, I wonder if any of you will do any changing. I sure hope so. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer is like a man seeing his natural face in a mirror, observes some dirt, and does nothing about it, okay? Goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he was, that there was some dirt on his face or whatever is what he's saying. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, 
this one will be blessed in what he does. So let's try to be more vigorous, joyful in our singing at church. Be, try to lift your holy hands in prayer once in a while. Try to keep the Sabbath a delight and the day of rest. Beware copying the traditions of men or making up your own traditions. And let's praise God that he gifts us with his righteousness. That's more than enough. We don't need to add to his righteousness. We accept his gift of his righteousness that he gives us, Romans 5, 17, the gift of righteousness, and Philippians 3, verse, verses 9 and 10. And he becomes our righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God through him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He is our righteousness. But remember, Jesus often broke the Jewish traditions on healing on the Sabbath, for example, and washings. He didn't wash as meticulously as they demanded. But he never broke God's law, not one time. I mean, even this thing about the red heifers, they're being so picky about it. The Bible just said, make sure you have a red heifer. Now the Jews have added that if you have more than two white hairs on this whole animal, there's no longer a red heifer. So they go inspecting it with a magnifying glass, and I kid you not. They're more righteous than God. Don't follow Judaism. Please don't. You can do better than that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you so thankful that you've given us your word and let us live by every word of, your, of yours. Not add to it, not, not take anything away, not add anything to it. Let you be our righteousness. Father in heaven, come and be our righteousness. We accept your gift of your righteousness through faith in Christ and that he fulfilled every requirement of the law for us, those of us who now have him living in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit like Romans 8, verse 3 and 4, clearly tells us. And so, Father in heaven, we thank you for that. We thank you for your gift of righteousness. We thank you that we don't have to go beyond what you say. We praise you as we lift our holy hands in praise and lifting them up to you. And we sing to you, we praise to you, and we're so delighted in you. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Jesus, our salvation. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.